Hey everybody, Mark Presley here, and welcome to Magic to Inspire. In this episode, I'm going to be talking about magic competitions. And by the way, you could join my group. I have a Facebook group called Magic Competition Directory. So we're going to be talking about magic competitions, uh, judging, uh, a whole bunch of good stuff. So stay tuned. Now what I'm going to be sharing with you is my thoughts, experience, and advice with winning and losing magic competitions. I'm going to share with you the good stuff, the great stuff, the nitty gritty, some things you're not going to want to hear. <laughs> Now one of the things you should be asking yourself before you even invest your time into entering a magic competition is why do you want to be in a magic competition? That's the important question. Do you want to be in a magic competition to, to better yourself and, and further the art of magic and get the experience, be in front of people, get uh, some input on your show from the judges and other people? Do you want to enter the magic competition to be a magician's magician? where you get noticed and next thing you know you're doing shows for clubs, conventions and doing lectures or do you want to enter a magic competition uh, to hopefully place and so you could use you know those those bragging rights on the social media and on your website so there's it could be all three it could be all three so that's one of the things I suggest that uh, you know you try to figure out maybe you're trying to work out uh, some new material and just see uh, where you're at with that. Now what I'm about to share with you on the topic of magic competitions is going to benefit a lot of people watching. Whether you're a judge or maybe somebody that's thinking about hosting their own magic competition or maybe you have a magic competition that you're doing already uh, all the way to a magician that wants to compete. I'm going to share with you my experiences, uh, my knowledge, and opinions. So hopefully this will help somebody out there. I'd like to think so. Okay, so one of my members in uh, my group, the Magic Competition Directory, uh, commented on one of my posts. And so I'm going to just read it and I'm going to address some of the things that he's talking about here. So again, this is from Joshua Thino. I've entered the local contests at my ring, but stopped doing them. The reason for it is nobody could give me any feedback. It is and was very disheartening to lose and not have anything to strive for and not understand why or how. I feel like the local clubs are unevenly judged. I wish I could perform at a bigger contest but there is no way I could afford it. Any suggestions? Well, first of all, I'm very sorry. Uh, the feedback of the judges are very important. You know, not, not just the scores. I think that should be done because you do need something to work off of. And now on a second note, I would like to defend judges just for a moment. A few years ago, I was a judge for a magic competition. It was my first time judging and uh, I was so excited. You know, to be able to be a judge and be part of the, the magic competition process. And one of the things that I found is that it was very difficult to put notes when you're judging. And here's the reason why. You see, let's say, for example, you're doing a manipulation act. And, there, and it's just awesome. Or it could be the opposite way. You could drop a ball or something. And so if I'm writing that down in my judge sheets... You know, I could be missing something. I could miss a move that was really good, or I could also miss a move that wasn't so good. So it kind of works both ways. So it's very hard to watch it act and at the same time take notes. Now what I did to combat that is I got very good at, I, I've been doing this a long time through school and, and everything like that. I, I'm really good at taking notes without looking down course uh, trying to read it might be <laughs> a challenge but I know my writing that's another story though so anyway I could write notes 
in my, uh, my, my little notebook. I'd have a blank notebook right here. And I would write all my notes for each performer. Before the contest started, I would put down a name on each sheet so I know who those notes are for. And then I would watch the performance and as I'm watching it, I would be kind of like scribbling. So that's what I did. And then later on I would clean it up and put it in the, uh, the regular notes that you get for, you, for your feedback, your, your competition notes, your, your score sheets. And now there's some judges that don't take the time to do that. And I kind of have a hard time with that because I feel that if you are taking the time to be in a competition, they should return the favor and equally return their time to give you some notes to work off of. Otherwise, what's the point of entering? Of course, everybody wants to win, but if you don't win, then you want to learn to grow. Now, for example, when I was competing at Abbott's, I've been going there for five years. And so each time out of those five years, I've been going there five years in a row, each time I go there, I'll tweak my act and make it uh, uh, a little bit different. I'll, I'll uh, go off of the judges' sheets, and if I think that what they're saying uh, has some value, that's when I'll, I'll change it up a little bit. And that's where it could get kind of a little bit confusing because you can't go off of everything they say. Otherwise, your act is never going to get good. It, you're just going to always be changing it just to please a judge. So, again, that's where it can be kind of confusing, and that's where sometimes your friends come in. You know, you share your video footage or, you know, you know whatnot about your act with other people, with friends, and get feedback. If you're getting a lot of people that are saying the same thing, then maybe you have to consider what they're saying. You, you also have to uh, be prepared to hear things that you're not going to want to hear because when it comes to magic competitions, uh, sometimes judges can be harsh and, and tell you things that you don't want to hear. But if you want to grow and advance in the art, you're going to have to uh, pull up your pants and be a big boy and hear some things that you don't want to hear. Now there's some judges, I feel, that maybe do not have a place in judging. And this is where it could get kind of tricky because what is a magic competition all about? Is it about performing in front of other magicians? Or is it about performing in front of a live audience? So with that being said, who should judge? As Eugene Berger always said, rest in peace, who judges the judges? And so with that being said, I feel that some judges shouldn't have the position or responsibility to be a judge. For example, if you're in a stage competition, should you really have somebody judging that does close-up magic? Let me explain further, okay? Let's say you ever watch those cooking shows where they uh, try to make the best dish. It's a, like a cooking show competition and they need some judges. So they go out and they find somebody on the street, uh, let's say uh, Susie's uh, pickles, all right? She has a vending truck and that's all she sells is pickles, okay? But uh, she doesn't know a thing about uh, cooking. She's not a chef, all right? But yet she, they have uh, Susie's pickles out there in the audience uh, judging your act. Okay, so are you going to feel confident that uh, somebody like Susie is gonna be judging you? Somebody that really isn't experienced in, in being a chef and cooking, right? All she does is she, she buys pickles from a wholesaler and sells them, right? I don't know if, <laughs> if that's a good example, but um, that's how it kind of is with judging at times. 
Now let's talk about lay people. Lay people judging in magic competitions. Now lay people kind of have their pros and cons. For example, with lay people, they're gonna pretty much be judging you on the value, your entertainment value. Are you entertaining? Are you entertaining to people that aren't magicians, a, a lay audience? Now most likely, a lay person isn't going to be uh, qualified to be able to recognize uh, any skill you may have in magic, any technical skills. And I really think there should be an even line as far as uh, entertaining people and also uh, being a skilled magician. In other words, if you're working your, your ass off on technique, but none of that is, is recognized, is that fear? Because somebody that is not a qualified magician that's qualified with skill is, is judging you. So do you think that's fear? So these are the questions you have to ask. And so I've seen some magic acts where there's a magician that's extremely technical, but then you have some kid that's doing like a stratosphere and maybe the crystal cylinder, and the kid just smokes them and wins and, and places and takes uh, first place. And now, I strongly believe that magic competitions should be separated uh, in age category. And here's why. I feel, through my experience, that sometimes when you mix the two together, you get what is called the cute factor. <laughs> and that's where uh, there's little kids performing and they're competing against adults. And there might be some people, not everybody, but there might be some people, some judges, that have, uh, you know, a little a little soft spot, if you will, to kids, their, their cuteness. And so they might be a little bit more uh, generous when it comes to uh, scoring. And now with that being said, there's been some competitions that I've been at and kids have just smoked uh, older people, adults. So again, the magic competition the stuff with magic competitions is really kind of tricky because there's so many variables and each competition is different and I wanted to address um, my friend uh, Joshua as far as uh, not getting the judging sheets so he has something to work on I would recommend that in the future if you want to enter in a magic competition, and this could go for, for anybody out there, if you're thinking about going into a magic competition, it doesn't hurt to ask questions because not every magic competition is for you. So don't be afraid to call them, shoot them an email, and ask them, will the where they'll where <laughs> I can't talk. Will there be uh, judging sheets after uh, the competition so we have something to go off of? Now, I also think it's a good idea for judges to get together after a competition and go over their notes to make sure that whoever got the highest score, if they do indeed deserve it. Because like I said before, <laughs> I've, I've been a judge in a contest before, and sometimes you have to write down things fast, you have to think fast, you have to score fast. And with that being said, sometimes it's not a bad idea to go back because you might find out, well, did this person really deserve it? You know, uh, the person that didn't place, yeah, he dropped the silk handkerchief, but he, he was pretty much flawless. You know, where the other guy that won uh, was dropping things left and right. But he had a outstanding costume. He, he wore a tux, whatever it may be. So I always think it's a good idea for judges to just compare notes, just to make sure that everything checks and that it's fair. Now let's talk about the judging sheets and what the judges are going to most likely be scoring you on. It varies. In each contest, each competition, 
uh, may be different, but most of them pretty much stick to the, the same thing here. Uh, you could be judged any, anywhere from uh, your clothes to your costume to applause, the flow of routine. Uh, does it make sense? Does it uh, have continuity? Those, those are the things that uh, you're going to be judged on. Now one of the most important things that you have to consider, and this is very important, is the time of your show. The, the, the timing of your routine, how many minutes. Uh, I've been in magic competitions where there's uh, seven to ten minutes allowed. Now I think, I'm not sure, don't quote me, but I think FISM is about 10 minutes. But uh, just keep that in mind, that your routine should be uh, carefully timed. So you're going to have to pay attention to whatever competition you are entering, because if you have a 10 minute routine and then you get there and you find out, oh, it's seven minutes, uh, you're going to be in trouble. Now what I do in my sewing routine, I, I have a, a, almost a, a different song for each of the routines that I have that's beautifully woven through my whole routine. So for each trick, I kind of have its own soundtrack. And now what that helps me with is when I have these different competitions that are different times, I'm able to take out, move things, replace according to, you know, the magic competition, the timing uh, for the competition. So I'm able to easily change things to fit and satisfy uh, the rules of the competition. So keep in mind your timing. If you're going to be going to, if, you, if your goal is to go to FISM, you might want to try to stick to magic competitions that are, again, 10 minutes long. Again, don't quote me, I'm not sure, but uh, Think it's right around there now one of the other things I wanted to talk about as far as judges is uh, judges that are Judges that are, are judging in the contest numerous times. Uh, I've been to a magic competition now where it, the same judge was judging three times in a row. So after a while, and I think that's really unfair because after a while they, they, they get to know your act, there's really no element of surprise, and now they're, they're being too critical. Okay, so I, and I think it I think it really is a conflict of interest at that point when you it, it really 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 I can't stress this to me questions the integrity of the magic competition because to me it kind of I don't know call me paranoid but it kind of makes me think well what's what's going on here you know what is really going on here if these same people keep judging and of course, there might not be anything going on at all. They might just like that judge. But for the sake of the performers, if, there peop if there's people out there that aren't placing and they're being loyal to you and they keep coming back, I think you should at least be respectful and uh, you know have, have new judges every year. Okay? That way there's not a, a conflict of interest. Now one of the things that I enjoy the most about magic competitions is the energy. The energy that you get when, when you're competing. I get a, a big huge adrenaline, adrenaline rush. Let's talk about your local magic club. I'd like to address uh, something else that Joshua said in that he felt that there's an unfairness in his local magic club. And I think there's a lot to be said about that. I, I kind of feel in some aspects there might be a little bit of uh, like a popularity contest or people uh, that are at the club that are judges that have favoritism over, over other 
members. So that's why a lot of times it's not a bad idea to, to go outside of where, where you're living, maybe a, a state or two over and compete where, where you don't know anybody. And then I feel that, that by doing that, you get a little bit more uh, honest uh, response and, and judging by doing that. Now I'm going to give you an example. There was a magic competition that I was at and they had one of the uh, officers competing in the magic competition and he ended up winning first place. And So I kind of felt like that isn't right. I don't think anybody that's uh, an officer, vice president, president, uh, anybody that, that is up there in the ranks in the Magic Club should have any business competing because to me that is a conflict of interest. For example, you wouldn't see that in FISM. You wouldn't see anyone in FISM that's, that's running FISM competing in a contest. Okay, now you could say to yourself, well, it's just, it's just a local club. It's just for fun. Okay, so you could have that mind frame. But then keep in mind that that could potentially happen. So you have to go in there with your mind frame that, you know, this is going to be fun. And it should be just about fun. You should just have the mind frame of when you go into a magic competition that you're just going in there to, to learn, have fun, and better yourself. Now, as I always say, everything is all good. It's all good in a magic competition when you win. But when you lose, uh, sometimes uh, you, you could do one of two things. You could walk away and, and, and say, oh, that was great. I had fun. I got to work on my act. There's you know things I need to improve. And then there's some interest, there's going to be some instances where you're going to feel like You're going to feel like there was a injustice. And sometimes there might be. Now I'm going to give you an example about that. What, it, what You might be thinking, well, what, did, what do you mean, Mr. Presley? What do you mean about sometimes you might be right with an injustice? Okay. <laughs> well, let me share it with you. Let's say one of the judges scored you really low because you made a, a huge frisbee appear. And you're looking at your judging sheets and you're, you see in your judging sheet, it says, what's up with the Frisbee? Well, uh, if you haven't noticed, my act is a, is a Frisbee act. I don't know if you saw the sign in the beginning of my routine, it said Frisbee inventor. And I made all these different colored Frisbees appear all different shapes and sizes and one had a hole in it and then it transformed into a square hole and so that's why I made the frisbee appear okay I might be kinda reaching far for that but at the same time I'm really not okay because uh, I have seen that happen so sometimes you just have you know, bad judges and other times you'll have judges that are extremely fair and qualified. I remember one time in a magic competition that I was in, one of the judges didn't show up. And so the people running the contest asked somebody from the audience if they would uh, be a judge. And that one person ended up being uh, Eugene Berger. Eugene Berger, the great Eugene Berger. And when I found that out, man, I was about to crap in my pants because now I felt like uh, the pressure was really on because here is a, you know, a famous magician uh, judging the contest. And uh, I ended up placing third in that one. And I, I remember feeling so honored because, you know, here's a man with so much experience and magic. And so... That was a memory that I'll never forget. That was really cool. 
and so not everybody is going to get your act and that doesn't mean that your act isn't good right? sometimes you just have judges as I spoke earlier are simply not qualified no don't be afraid after your, your competition if you feel like something uh, isn't accurate or right don't be afraid to go to the judge and talk to them okay because you you deserve you know answers especially if you feel feel like you were wronged uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with with questioning them uh, to find out where 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 they came up with with this reason of why they they scored you now that isn't really going to change anything with your uh, displacement in a co magic competition but at least you are able to express something because there is at times a little bit of unfairness at magic competitions it happens that's all all part of the business now I wanted to touch a little bit more on clicks I'm kind of jumping around here when I was talking about clicks uh, I've seen I've been in some uh, competitions where there's not only uh, clicks but some of the magicians are uh, schmoozing and that's where they're kind of talking buddy buddy and all friendly friendly to, to the judges before the competition and that is a big huge no-no to me now even though it might be innocent and sincere it still kind of plants a seed and people observing other magicians, competitors, you know, when, 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 especially if they win. So I really think that before a competition, before that competition starts, all the people competing should be in another room. Nowhere near uh, audience members mingling, talking, schmoozing. They should all be, you know, separate from them. Now, another thing I wanted to, to go over as far as preparing for a magic competition is try to know your stage try to get to uh, know the area you're going to be performing if you could look at the the stage ahead of time that's great because then you get an idea of where you're going to place your props how far you have to be set back or set your equipment up if you're going to be you know closer to the audience know ahead of time uh, if you're going to need a microphone and also have your music ready and I strongly suggest that you have backup upon backup upon backup with your music and what I mean by that is I'm going to give you a few examples now there's different formats to do your music <laughs> now back in the day when I was younger we had you know tapes we would have cassette tapes that we would give the sound person and then which eventually grew into uh, CDs and now a lot of it is uh, could be flash drives or uh, music that that you send them in the in, in an email format you now I was at one time gonna be on TV uh, WGN TV and the sound person came up and asked me for my music and I had it on a CD and I had about uh, four different formats you know I had like wave AIFF that type of thing and the sound person came up to me and he, he said shortly after I gave him the CD he's like this isn't working it's I can't get it going and then that's when I told him that there was about three other different formats on there and sure enough he came back and he, he said that it worked so that's an instance where I do backup upon backup upon backup now, when I was in Magic Palooza Magic Competition, I had about three different backups. And when I won the competition, I was to perform in the evening show. And so I went to the sound person and I went to hand him my, my iPod, not realizing that my iPod battery was dead. Now, I had a backup in the hotel room, but they were really kind of in a in a crunch with trying to get things together so I didn't even have time to go to the hotel room to get the other device or to get the cord for the iPad actually his system that he had 
didn't have uh, the capability of plugging in like a USB or something. And before I left, <laughs> I sent myself an email, uh, a music file of my whole routine. So I asked the sound person, uh, do you have internet? Can you get internet here? Now a lot of these magic conventions, they make makeshift uh, theaters in the banquet room. And so sometimes it's kind of challenging to get uh you know, an internet connection. But after a few minutes, he was able to uh, to get internet. So I logged into my email, and I was able to. He was able to download my song for my email. So that's something to to keep in mind. There is be prepared. Be prepared for anything to go wrong. When you're practicing, and something goes wrong, think to yourself, this could happen. You know, when I'm on stage, when I'm competing. So you try to iron out everything that you're doing. Practice, practice, practice until you can do it practically uh, blindfolded. Another thing you should be aware of is the lighting. When you're practicing in your studio, it's a lot different than when you get on that stage. Especially when you have those bright, hot lights pointing down at you. I was in a competition one time and I was going to take my thimble and I was going to throw it in the air and it transforms into a silk. A, a, a beautiful white silk comes slowly floating down and I catch it. Well, the light blinded me and when I threw that handkerchief up in the air, I couldn't see it. So then the following year, I learned that I need to either kind of go to my side and when I throw it, you know, throw it that way or kind of step back away from the light. And this past contest, I was really, really proud of myself because I was really conscientious about my lighting and where I'm standing in conjunction of the lighting and when I throw things up in the air to catch it. Because you could easily uh, get lost with that lighting. Um, yeah, so just, just try to be aware of, of your lighting and you know where you're supposed to be standing well now with the lighting sometimes you're, it's so blinding that you're only going to see the first uh, few rows after that everything's pitch black so sometimes that could be uh, kind of a weird feeling when you don't you know see too many people in the audience you know you're expecting a big huge crowd and you can only see you know the first few rows so you have to be conscientious about that too, especially if you're going to be going into the audience uh, asking for volunteers. So it's not a bad idea to, to learn the layout of uh, how, the, how the chairs are positioned before you go out there and compete. So what I'm trying to say is try to get to know as much as you can about the staging, about the lighting, about the sound, about how the chairs are set up. All these come into play. Uh, tell me, Mr. Dell, uh, how did you happen to discover this amazing talent of yours? Now I'm going to be wrapping things up in a little bit, and you're going to be hearing from a couple magicians that have competed. They're going to talk a little bit about their experience. One of them is uh, Jason Jordan, and he's from the Magic Club that I go to, and also magician Bill Cook. Hey everybody, I'm Jason Jordan. Um, just here to tell you a little bit about the competitions that I've entered, magic competitions. I'm watching people dance right now, but I'm not worried about that. What I'm worried about is telling you how much I've benefited from doing magic competitions. For me, the biggest lesson I learned is it's not about placing. It's about just having fun and enjoying yourself. And uh, before I considered that, as a nervous wreck, I, I couldn't even step on stage. It was, it was terrible. Um, but now that I know, just go out and have fun. I don't care what, where I place. I, I enjoy it a lot, and I do better too. Um, so that's my advice to you. Uh, hope you take it to heart, and talk to you guys soon. Bye bye. So what do you mean, Mark? 
Well, I would like to ask you, how has Magic Competitions benefited you? Wow. So Magic Competitions forced me to think outside the box. I hate you both. <laughs> so, uh, I won't do it anymore, I promise. So Magic Competitions forced me to think outside the box and to really draw on creativity that I don't, didn't know existed. Um, uh, my dad told me that competition was for the competent, and that forced me to kind of rethink how I went about practicing. I thought about practicing in a new way. I thought about practicing more for, more for my own entertainment than it was for trying to win the contest. And then what wound up happening is the more I practiced, the more fun I had, the more fun I had, the more it looked like I was having fun when I was competing. Um, and then that just kind of transformed, transformed my whole way of thinking. Um, I met all my friends through competitions. I met all my magic friends through competitions. Um, because I competed, uh, the pros that would come to the contests would then critique me. And then through their critiques, I would stay in touch, and staying in touch, I would make my friends, and it's pretty, you know, you can see how the progression goes. Right. Um, so most of it was pretty positive and fun. Is, was there any times where you did not think it was positive or, or fun? Yeah, they always put competitions in the morning. <laughs> and I am not a morning person. They always put the competition, like, your call time is 6 a.m. Are you kidding? All the teen comp because I, I only did teen competitions. I didn't compete in anything as an adult. Um, partly because I stopped competing because at a certain point um, there's a weird stigma about you being in the building. There's this like, oh my god, he's here. He's gonna he's gonna compete. Well, no, I'm just here. Why do people? Th okay, whatever. And then if I compete and I don't do well, there's this, yeah, yeah, I beat him. No, you got to remember, we're in a magic contest. It's not like a race for a political office. I mean, it's, it's, we're, we're still friends and we still got a gig after we get home from this. So um, I stopped competing as an adult because it didn't make any more sense for me. Gotcha. But, um, uh, and, and it was Kevin James who pointed that out to me. Kevin James said the reason he went on America's Got Talent was to get on TV. And that's it. Um, and he stopped doing um, competitions and TV shows. He stopped doing competitions and TV shows because they were no longer good for him. So, unless he is being shown in the best light, he won't be on TV. So, gotcha. that's just kind of the way I look at it. Um, I don't want to go to FISM. I don't want to go to the IBM SAM. Um, I, uh, I did. I competed at the IBM SAM in 2014 and was told a lot of great things by a lot of great people and then was hurt. I had my feelings hurt um, because I learned there were a lot more politics involved behind the scenes than there should be. Right. And as a result of that, I just decided that's not something I want to deal with anymore. And now that's an interesting thing that you just said because I find that there's a lot of magicians like yourself that compete and maybe they don't place but they're just going out there and kicking ass like like you, you know, and so I think that has a lot to uh, you know to say about that. I I I feel like I have an unfair bias. Yes, I work, um, and thankfully work begets work. But I had an unfair advantage where I was filmed in a competition that was made into a documentary movie, and as a result of that, people think that I am this maverick that goes and competes. Whereas there are other competition magicians like um, Trent James, who has won almost every competition he's entered and wasn't in a documentary. And I think he has far more accolades than I do. And I know he works his butt off. But people look at me like, oh, he's working so hard because he was in this movie. <laughs> you know, I have very specific targeted, market, targeted markets that I, I hit. I have... Um, um, I have very specific clients. I have very specific places that I like to work. And 
I work the heck out of them. I really do. But um, yeah, I've also pounded the pavement a lot, and I've had a lot of great mentors that I have sought out over the years. And mentors don't just come to you. This whole "when you're ready, the master appears" bullshit is exactly what it is. It's BS. You find your masters and you ask them, "Will you help me?" Because it's not going to happen if you don't ask. Right. Uh, what else you got? <laughs> Did I answer the question? I, uh, oh yeah, you did like more talking, than swinging in circles. More than great. Uh, one of my uh, Facebook uh, people in my group, he uh, was asking, how can he get into magic competitions, the big ones, when he doesn't have the funds? Uh, okay. Um, yeah, a lot of those competitions take an entry fee. Um, my contest has never taken an entry fee. Uh, we don't pay either. Point. Um, <laughs> we turn into a show. It's a competition, but it's a show. Right. Um, uh, you know what's really interesting that's come about in the past few years has been crowdsourcing. Crowd, uh, crowd, was it crowdfunding? Is that the right word? Oh, yeah, GoFundMe. GoFundMe or, you know, any of the number of those. And, you know... Because most of these magic competitions have a prize. Right, right. right. They have a monetary prize. And what's the entry fee? 100 bucks, 200 bucks? Right. Plus having Unless you're going to FISM, then it's several thousand. Well, FISM is different. You have to be um, recommended by a FISM body. Now, I if you see. want to go to FISM, you have to have, you have to be invited by FISM to perform at FISM. So, is that right? Yeah. So that's, that's different now. It's a, that's a whole set of different politics. Right. You have to. You either have to to, to um, compete and win a FISM regional, um, be selected by the SAM, be selected by the IBM, or the Magic Castle. So you have to win like FISM North America, which I don't know where that exists. But there's a FISM North America winner, and a FISM South America winner. But you've had to go to Blackpool to compete in it. Or the IBM SAM convention always has FISM qualifiers. Or um, I don't think Abbott's has a FISM qualifier, but there are conventions that have FISM qualifiers that you have to qualify to get an invite, and then you buy your ticket, and then you pay to go, and then you pay their entry fee. But um, I'll tell you this there's a truck coming, so one second. I, will, I, I can honestly and safely say that Magic Conventions did nothing but stroke my ego. Magic Conventions did not get me more gigs. Did not make me more money. Is that right? For myself, yes. Yeah. Um, magic Conventions were a great way to meet my friends, meet my Magic friends, and hang out with my Magic buddies. But the hours of work was not worth the... The, the pain and anguish of you know the day, the, the weeks leading up to it, the days leading up to it, and the night before, and the, the the lack of a night, good night's sleep, and the knot in my stomach, and then the shakes leading up to the performance, and it's like, why am I doing this? What? Now you're talking about magic competitions or yeah. conventions? Magic competitions. Okay, okay. Well, go to conventions, work conventions. If you can get into work conventions, um, find the people that book the conventions. Yeah. Submit tapes. Ask what they're looking for. Ask what they would like to see. Um, that's the stuff that's that's great. But right. so you're saying magic competitions really got you nowhere. Magic competitions, I, you know, it's it's hard to hear. But magic competitions didn't make me money. Yeah. Um, magic comp. Layman will go. I'll say I was a you know three time winner at the World Magic Seminar in Las Vegas, and they'll go. Oh, okay. As far as they're concerned, I was working the paint thinner con convention. They don't know. They don't know what the World Magic Seminar was. They don't know what Magic Live is. Now, we know that Magic Live, Genie, the Society of American Magicians, the International Brotherhood of Magicians, Abbott's World Magic Seminar, uh, the, the um, Columbus Magi Festival, they know that all we magicians know that these are huge things. But laymen go, all right, so um, can you work my kid's birthday? Yeah, right. <laughs> Well, of course I can't, but that's not the point. <laughs> right. 
I did hear, though, that in some of your Asian, you know, in, in Asia, magic competitions do help as far as getting, uh, you know, work and jobs. It's a lot different out there. Um, yeah. Um, see, that's tough because then you got to go to Asia. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I'd love to say that the International Asia Convention that, you know, they, they have it once a year and they always bring people over from America to do it. Yes, it's great. If you want to compete, do it. But I know for myself, my competitions do not make the money. Um, people want people want to see fool us. People want to see... There's this really bizarre thing where it's, hey, the guy from TV's at our party. The guy on the news. The guy who's in the newspaper. Or gal. The guy or gal that's in, you know, on the news or in the newspaper. The, guy, the person that's on TV. It's not... I could say that I was just performing in theaters for 1,500, 2,000 people. And they go, yeah, it's great. Can you work my daughter's birthday for 20 people? Fine. But when they see you on the little box on their, on their entertainment center, that's when it becomes real. Yeah. So, um, and, I, and, you know, I'm not saying... <laughs> I know for myself, I, I've gotten very, very lucky with Fool Us. Uh, I got very, very lucky with Masters, um, and all I've done is submitted my video at the right time and answer the call when it came in. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm the, the wrong person to ask that question about. Uh, <laughs> I have a very, very bizarre horseshoe wedged somewhere. I don't know if that helps or not. Cool. It will, uh, I tell you, thank you very much for your time and giving uh, our viewers some insight on, on magic competitions. Well, and, uh, yeah, and, but, okay, so as a person, though, that puts on a magic competition every year, mm -hmm. I'm going to say this. Um, the less demands on your tech that you can make, the better. I give two demands. When I, when I was doing my, my CD Act, my Competition Act, I asked for two things. Blackout at the top and lights on at 47 seconds. And they would know that because the music would stop and I would put my glow sticks behind my back. When they stopped seeing the glow sticks to turn the lights onto a general wash. And the, the only other thing I asked, so blackout, lights on, and don't touch my music. Don't touch my music. My music, there were pauses built in. And I would have a, a, a beat track. Yeah, I have the same thing. Where it's a pulse. Right. It's a low rumble mm, 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 right. pulse. And I would say, just don't touch my music. Because I got it. Because I've done this to this. Right. Um, take up the least amount of space backstage that you can. Um, and just like, the, just like Burning Man, leave it better than you found it. Yeah, there um, you go. When you're backstage, if you're using confetti, pick up... Pick up more than your confetti. If this guy, if this person's practicing their snowstorm before you even started packing your packing your stuff, pick up their confetti. It's gonna make life easier for everybody. There's mosquitoes, and I'm playing invisible ninja out here. Um, uh, so take up as little space backstage as possible. Um, pick up after yourself and others, um, and uh, just be light on your tech crew. And you know, there were there were times where. The tech crew messed up my stuff, but it was still my fault. It's on me because I didn't ask for it. Thank you, kid. Uh, because I wasn't clear with my instructions. So if there's a mistake, the tech crew is there to run tech. They can't remember every single person's cue. So that's why I tried to make it easy. If there's a mistake, yes, it's the tech person's fault, but you as the performer have to take the blame for it. That's just my own, because I, I, run, I run I run a contest every year, right, so right, I, I get right, it. Right. All right, well, we're going to wrap it up here. Sorry, I, and, I uh, probably threw you way too much. Oh, no, no, <laughs> you did awesome. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Uh, and if you have any questions, drop me a message. You can find me on Facebook. You can find, you can call me. You can find my, find my email, billcookmagic at gmail.com. Here I am. There we go. Ask away. Thank you. Bye. 
I just wanted to thank Bill Cook and Jason Jordan for your time and giving us some insight on uh, magic competitions. And right now I'd like to wrap up with a story. This is one of my favorite stories that my friend, my good friend and mentor, Steve Hart, has shared with me. And he was a judge one time. And Dan Sperry happened to be one of the magicians competing. And G Dan Sperry did not place in the magic competition that he was competing in. And he was very, very uh, upset. He, he thought that he should have won. Now, my buddy, Steve Hart, he scored Dan Sperry uh, very high because of his creativeness you know I mean he just really was different where a lot of uh, the other judges they didn't really see that quality and they scored them less and I kind of see that happening a lot in magic competitions where uh, creativity skill and technique are kind of uh, overlooked you know instead it seems like the the cookie cutter stuff that sometimes wins not in all cases, but, you know, I've, I've seen that happen quite a bit as well. And so Dan Sperry was kind of, you know, upset. And Steve Hart uh, had a talk with him, and he, he, Steve asked him, what is it that you want to do? And Sperry said, well, I'd like to, to travel and do lectures. And Steve kind of uh, shaked his head and was like, well... You don't have to win a competition to do that. You could do that right now. And so a perfect example of magic competitions. Here's somebody that didn't place, and he's now traveling around the world. He's, he's traveling around the world and has been on network TV uh, doing his magic. So that's a perfect example. So just because you win a magic competition, just because you place, doesn't mean all of a sudden... You're going to get a poof of dust and your life's going to change and you're going to be, you know, doing all this stuff. You'll find out that uh, you're going to still have to work hard. Because I thought the same thing. Like when I won Magic Palooza and Daytona Magic, I, I competed in both of those in 2016. And I won first place in both of them. And they were only about four months apart. It was in Florida. So I went to Florida. One Magic Palooza, went back home, and then several months later went to Daytona, competed in there, and won first place in that. And so here I thought that because I won first place, I was kind of kind of get noticed, and I was going to start, you know, performing at some of these conventions, and none of that happened. So you have to really have the the mind frame of doing this for fun, and that if you place, that that's great and everything. But you're going to have to still work hard. Okay? You're going to have to still work hard and hustle. Now, one other thing that I would like to address that Joshua is asking about that I didn't touch base on. So really quick, he was talking about how he would like to enter into other magic competitions. But, uh, you know, sometimes it's the expense, the money that... Uh, is difficult at times. So the only thing I su uh, could suggest to you, Joshua, is that there's there's uh, different resources out there now in the social media where you could start a, like a GoFundMe, uh, you know, Go GoFundMe page to try to uh, uh, get some money together, some funds, so you could go and compete if that's what you want to do. Now, when you get up there with FISM, I believe that uh, they kind of pay for it. They 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 pay for uh, whatever it's going to cost as far as going out there and, and competing. But that's a that's a whole nother uh, video segment. But what I would suggest to you is try, try to raise money. You could do shows. You could try to you know ask help from from family and friends. Uh, just be creative. Now one of the things I really like about magic competitions is the the energy I get such an adrenaline rush when I'm you know getting ready to go out there and, and perform and I think it's such a great thing to you know have these competitions a lot of, a lot of times there's lay people in the audience who never been to anything 
like that before. And so what a treat it is for them to be able to, you know, experience that and, and see the art of magic in a, in a different way. I really, I really like being with other magicians as well. And, you know, being together and having, you know, something that uh, we're all interested in. Now there was this one magic competition I was in, and it was at a like a club, like a nightclub, a bar. And a lot of people from the bar, they found out that there was a contest going on. So they, they went there, it was free. So hey, that was great. And everybody wins, you know, we get a nice audience. And you know, the, the owners of the bar got people that were, uh, you know, spending money on drinks and food. This is Hans Schlegel and Leland Melvin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm together. Huh? <laughs> and uh, we're getting ready to go to the, space sometime soon. German and American. German, <laughs> German and American. <laughs> ah, yeah. Yes. One other thing that I'd like to add is that, now this is my personal feelings, but if you're going to be hosting a magic competition, you know, put on a suit or a tux, or, or for crying out loud, khakis and a, a polo shirt. Don't go up there in shorts and a, a, a t-shirt. You know, these guys are, are putting in their time. Uh, most of them are even paying the the uh, convention fee to be in there at a couple hundred dollars. So at least give a little back by at least looking good. And giving the, uh, the the people performing, you know, the respect and honor that they deserve. You know, treat it like it's something special, not just something that you're you're throwing together. You know, uh, dress up and 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 look good and put some meaning into what you're doing. Now, one of the things that I really like about magic competitions is the energy. You know, being around all the magicians and, you know, they're getting the uh, the show ready, you know, all the lights. And I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in. I really hope that all of us are able to, to give you an idea of what to expect in a magic competition. I hope that this helps everybody uh, as far as... Uh, magicians competing, judges, people, again, people that might be thinking about starting their own competition or somebody that's running one already. Because we all have a little bit to learn from everybody. There's, there's, uh, like I said earlier, uh, in the beginning of this video, I'm going to share with you the good, the bad, the ugly. So hopefully I shared with you uh, more positive things. I hope I have. Uh, and all I could say is... Uh, Hey, just go for it. Just do your best and have fun. I'm Mark Presley. Have a magical day.